Good day, my lovely listeners. You are listening to the Forty Orty Podcast. Tune in every week to explore inspiring stories and insightful information that dive headfirst into the world of autism and mental health. With all those tantalizing tongue twisters out of the way, let's get into the show. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Forty Orty Podcast. We have a little bit of a special episode today. We are talking around the topic of the Asperger's in Society documentary, which is a documentary that I did in my final year of university. Most people do research. I decided to make a full-length film, as you do. But basically, the whole premise of this documentary is talking about autism from a personal angle and also from sort of an outsider's perspective and merging them together to get a good representation of autism in the present day. It has had a lot of important, sort of very good responses uh, from people such as National Autistic Society, um, a few other radio shows, media relations team at the university. So there's a lot of good stuff that's coming from this. And today I'm joined by Esme. Esme. Always get that wrong. <laughs> Don't worry about it. <laughs> Always get the name wrong. Esme. Yes. Esme Hayes. Hello. <laughs> who is one of the interviewees that I um, interviewed, interviewed, of course. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> we sort of had a little bit of a chat. We sort of met through, I think, Norman Darwin. Yes. Is it, is it yeah. like from Ac- Access Summit? Is that what it's called? I can't remember. Yes, it's the uh, DAS, so like Disability Access something <laughs> something um, for University of Manchester. Yeah. Well, he was like an advisor. I still have weekly phone calls with Norman. Um, but yeah, uh, he told me about the documentary and told me to go up for it. And then I, I got in contact with you, of course. You did. And we we had a little bit of a, a chat before the cameras were rolling and then um, a long chat, which is going to be uploaded hopefully soon to the Asperger's Growth Channel and also the Asperger's and Society website. This is sort of a series entitled Behind the Scenes. And it's based basically to give everybody a bit of a insight into the interviews because I'm I'm sure you can you can probably tell as me from the the final products that I cut out a lot. <laughs> like <laughs> Yeah, but like I, I think I, I think I really like the way it's edited, actually, because I feel like you get from from small snapshots from different people when they're compiled together, you get like a, a full idea of what's being expressed. I feel like everyone failed to say entirely what they wanted to say, but when you put it all together, like it makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, I quite liked that actually. <laughs> also, I, I felt that I said, I, I, I did what I did and I ran my mouth out. <laughs> and um, then I went so through, I appreciate- searched through it, <laughs> had a look. Chopped out the good emotional juicy bits and put it put it into the <laughs> yeah. documentary. Yeah, but it's, it's a shame no one cried. <laughs> <laughs> but I was I was actually making I, I was actually uh, going through the behind the scenes video, sort of check it over and edit it. And every time it was getting to a bit that uh, that was included in the documentary, because I've been so like, I've got I've got so much experience. Like I've watched the same clips over and over again for so long. It was really weird. <laughs> that things didn't cut off at the end like yes <laughs> so i was expecting it to just go to black or go to another person speaking but <laughs> it's just a full interview but yeah it's I, I hope that this sort of like this podcast and this these behind this behind the scenes series will give people a bit more of an in-depth sort of view of of the opinions of you know that people are in it because it's i would love to include every single bit um of the interviews but you know that would be like nine hours long or something well that would be like having decent representation of autistic people (laughs) 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 but i i mean i just like 
I know this is a bit like rude, but when you said your use of the word special episode um, really made me laugh. <laughs> so I've been suppressing laughter for about All like right, yeah. five minutes. A it just special episode like, with yeah. a special person special. on a special related special co- people. podcast. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I mean that that is why we're all here. Yes. Do you want to do you want to give everybody a little bit of a um introduction into to who you are? Well, I was I think it's safe to say that I was clueless um for a very very long time. Um I I muddled along <laughs> as I think most people do when they're not diagnosed, especially autistic women. I muddled along. I didn't muddle along particularly well um but like i i did well enough adequately enough like academically socially that i i kind of progressed through life not too worse off than most people but the thing is is like i struggled i really really struggled especially as adolescence hit and i kind of thought <laughs> that's something different about me but i i had no idea what that could be um, and I just thought, I just thought I'm weird. Everyone else is normal mm-hmm. and I'm weird. Um, and then I went to college. I made friends who I would say like, they're still my, like my core friendship group now. Like people that I, I sort of hope to have like in my life for the rest of my life. Uh, some of them happen to be autistic and I kind of, I, I just sort of asked them about it out of politeness originally because that that's how I learned to socialize it mm-hmm. ask other people about their interests and their lives you know because because that's what you do no and I don't do it insincerely I'm just saying like yeah social social code yeah it's it's something that like I think maybe you initially do because you think you have to do it and then it becomes something that you just naturally do mm-hmm. uh anyway like so they told me about autism and I kind of I think I recognised some things in what they were saying, but I was in denial. Mm-hmm. Or if if I wasn't in denial, like I was so certain of like there being no possibility that I wasn't just quote unquote normal. That like I I just rejected any idea that like went against that. So it didn't like it didn't really make that much of an impact on me. And then like I started to talk to them more about it. And like I, I developed an interest in autism, um, and then, and this is why I think we're talking about representation today. We are. Thank you for introducing that topic for us. I think the reason we're talking about representation today is I would not. I'm pretty certain that I would not be diagnosed if it wasn't for the Swedish crime series, The Bridge, because I got completely engrossed by that program. It's amazing. And I. It oh I'm so oh my god I'm so glad you watched it. It's a really good film, isn't it? It's just like beautifully crafted. Well, it's just if anyone like I feel like it's so important in if if there ever exists an autistic canon, and I hope there will be one one day, one that's like written about extensively. Like the bridge has to be in it, mm-hmm. and like I just identified with the protagonist so much, and she she's just a wonderful. Like all the characters are wonderful, but like she is specifically wonderful. Yeah, empathize with her a lot. Well, yeah, but like she she's this wonderful character. So I looked it up, and through that, I found all these articles about women and autism. Uh, this was the point when the the penny really started to drop, mm-hmm. um, and I was like, ah, <laughs> I called like my best friend at the time, who is autistic, and. Uh, I mean, he's now my boyfriend, so um, uh, I called him, and I, I'm pretty distressed, actually, and I was like, "Is what is this? I, surely I'm not autistic. Am I, am I talking nonsense? Had this really long conversation with him, and I, I kind of had, like, a full-scale mental breakdown. And, like, it, it, was, it was difficult, but the thing is, is what came out of it is I became really determined to pursue a diagnosis and it took me about a year but uh, and like a lot of messing about yeah a lot of messing about so basically like i I had this 
emotional breakdown, pursued a diagnosis, took me a year. I was in university by the time I got it. It was very soon after that I found out about this, actually. So I was still pretty giddy um, Mm -hmm. off of getting it. Now time has passed since then. I've had more time to kind of consider it. And I I think, think about it in a more nuanced way. Initially, I was excited because I felt like it had given me an identity. But I think what you come to realise is that it's it's not that it's given you an identity. It just is your identity. Mm-hmm. Confirmation that you get medically, like, I think it, it assists you, but, like, you shouldn't have to depend on it. Yeah. It's sort of like a means means to an end. Yeah. I, I understand that. Cause, I mean, although I was diagnosed at the age of 10, you know, I've sort of been living my life and, and having that sort of support. Very limited support at school. Yes, yeah. I still there was there was a point in sort of I think about like first or second year at U at uni where I actually had to start reading about it and and learning about it and I did sort of get a bit you know giddy. You start reading things and you you think read about masking and you read about all these all these concepts that you you're very new to. And I guess, like, you need time to process and and think about it and form your own opinions about those things. Because, like, although it is now with with anything like social, anything that's sort of not completely black and white, a bit, you know, a bit grey, you have to have your own opinion on it. Well, I think you just have an impulse to, like, you 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 have an impulse to like latch onto an idea of yourself because you're like so desperate for things to be like uncomplicated. Mm-hmm. You you seek out stuff because you're like, I just I just want to make sense of things because I'm so confused. And I think like the the first time that you read stuff on autism as an autistic person is it's bizarre. It's like you know imagine. People say, oh, I identify with fictional characters. Mm-hmm. Imagine if you picked up a random book of a shelf and, like, it was your life story. Yeah. <laughs> and, like, <laughs> it, knew, it was, like, the character was you, mm-hmm. basically. Like, for me, like, that was... <laughs> learning about autism felt like that. And, like... It's almost like, like a... Um, I don't... Um, an accurate uh, star sign chart, isn't it? Yeah, and it's like it, it's exactly like that because it's not exactly an enjoyable experience. <laughs> it's actually very kind of creepy. You're like, <laughs> it makes you your sense of self. I think feels a bit threatened by it because you're like, how can there, how can there be anything that like defines me this well? <laughs> that like because. You know, that's not what personalities are supposed to be. They're supposed to be like these diverse, unknowable things. Mm-hmm. When you are a type of person who, like, in many ways, your personality does have a diagnosis, to have your what is you discussed in such a medical and precise uh, way, it's disturbing. <laughs> But it but it also provides a great sense of relief because you're like, no one's ever spelled it out for me like this, this clearly, you know? It's very like contrasting, isn't it? It's like it's it's good and it's bad. And I think like when when you start reading about these things and you start you you start building who you are up again because you, you have yes. these ideas that are very common these experiences that are very common and feelings, you sort of have to build yourself up as the autistic person, Thomas, or the autistic person, Esme, <laughs> rather than yeah. just... Esme or Thomas, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but not in a bad way. Well, I, I feel like the maturity of it is... Uh, I'm trying to express this clearly. <laughs> um, 
something that I, I really would encourage that people avoid, and it's like it's a really hard thing to avoid, and I think it's a pitfall for everyone, is identifying too much with the condition. Mm-hmm. Because you are not a disorder, <laughs> and so much about you cannot be classified as autistic. Yeah. You are you are you fundamentally. And I think sometimes it's it's too comfortable to to just be autistic. Yeah. And I think if if that were to change, um I think what has to happen is is there has to be more stuff like this. There has to be more autistic people uh just talking about themselves and talking about their lived experiences so that it becomes less unusual for you know when when children or adults are investigating autism or whether they're autistic they're not looking purely at um like nhs website yeah. like they're they're hearing from people what it is like to be a certain kind of person and not even a certain kind of person but my boyfriend uh is is doing research into autism at the moment because he he's he's looking to write some stuff on on it and i can't remember who it's from but there's this academic which discusses how autism should be f- viewed as like all these different people all waiting for the same bus mm-hmm. because he's like if we can't be certain of what autism is as a condition, like we can't be certain of what it is biologically or socially, we just know that it is it is a thing that exists that unites all these different people. Yeah. It's gotta yeah. be considered like something as arbitrary as waiting for a bus, but in this case it's necessary that all these people wait for the bus. They need so, to get on that bus. Yeah, they need to get on the bus, and they all have the shared experience of needing to get on the bus, which is distinct to people who don't have to get on the bus. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We got 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 a bus pass that you gotta take take hold of, <laughs> or else you're just gonna be drifting, <laughs> drifting on the it road. Yeah. That you go on it's that like. <laughs> It's like a, like a long stretch of road which which goes off into the mist, and if you try walking one way, you'll just end up back in the same place. You got to get on that bus. It's a, it's a Greta Thunberg autocracy, <laughs> where if you don't use public transport, people with guns come for you. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like, and I thought that was a good analogy because. I don't like to think that like the only thing that unites me and you, Tom, or like makes us get on is that we're autistic. Mm-hmm. And I, I think in many ways it's not because I think, and you'd say this as well, like it's not like I get on with every autistic person I meet. Oh, you know? no. Yeah. Like <laughs> I, I definitely do not get on with. It's, it's, it's a weird thing to say because it's, it is obvious, but I don't think many people say it, but. Autistic, autistic, some autistic people can be arseholes. Like, it yeah. can be so horrible. It's like there's, there's, there's this one instance of this, uh, this guy who is, is it, I mean, poor lad, like, he's, he's definitely not in, in the, the fittest state, but he um, sort of reached out to me and we, we got chatting and I was like, yeah, yeah, we can, we can chat now and again. I'll check in with you, see how you're going on. And, um, it got to the point where he was like getting annoyed at me for not replying quick enough. So like if Yeah, well that's a classic. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just I mean there's there's got to be a line where you, where you say it's it's either okay, right. Maybe maybe you're not fully understanding what autism is and you if you haven't worked on these things, but you know, we're going to have to part ways because you're causing a great inconvenience to my life. And I think this is a really good way to segue into inclusion. Yeah. Because something that I think is is so avoided <laughs> by exactly the people who claim to, like, say that they are the ones 
creating inclusive environment. Um, I think there's a lot of fear of like um, addressing that autistic people are people and they behave badly sometimes, like they behave like terribly sometimes, mm -hmm. as terribly as non-autistic people do. And the thing is, is if if you're so worried, if you're so nervous about being insensitive, um, that you actually stop treating someone like you treat other people. Because if, like, let's say that guy wasn't autistic and he was being a prat, I'm sure, like... Do you get the same response? Well, I'm, I, I feel like people around him would say, like, you're behaving badly, yeah. like, sort it out. But then if people are afraid that, like, that there'll be some bad consequence for them or, like, they're being insensitive, if, if they say to someone straight, like, this isn't okay, that's not inclusivity, is it? No, it's, it's sort of pandering to... Because you'll, you'll get people in those situations if you do. You know, the, the sort of worry is that other people will sort of pitch in and say, hey, you can't, you can't treat him like this. Like, he doesn't know any better. He's autistic or, or whatever kind of um, difference that he has. Well, and it's massively infantilizing. Mm -hmm. I feel like so, so often being autistic is, is like <laughs> not dissimilar to being a child. And the, the way people treat you is, is like they treat you like a child they do, yeah. and expect you to behave like a child. No wonder there are so many autistic people who, who do behave childishly and don't mature. It's, it's like, if that's how you're taught to behave, yeah. then, then why would you be any different? I definitely do think there's, there's, there is like a, a big sort of... Because I suppose it, it does depend on the environment that someone's brought up in, but you yeah. know, you've, you've got that whole um, <clears throat> difficulty around sort of raising autistic children that, you know, the mothers and fathers who, who haven't had any experience with it don't know how much to sort of keep them safe and don't know how much to expose them to the world. And you need to get like the, the amount right for the person, don't you? You can't like wrap them up in cotton blanket because then they're not going to mature and then... I feel like sometimes it's easier for parents who, like, have undiagnosed children because they don't have any expectations and they're not, like, scared out of parenting as they would normally. Mm -hmm. You know, like, they just do things as they do anyway and then... And, like, it has problems. Like, it's it's... <laughs> It's made problems for me um, because, like, I don't think it meant that I was, like, sufficiently prepared for a lot of things because, like, I didn't realise that I was on the back foot in, in a lot of situations. Yeah. Um, and, like, it, it does cause difficulty, but, like, it, I think it gives you freedom that you don't necessarily get if you get diagnosed really early yeah you know you get the you get the liberty to be yourself um and being yourself might mean like that people tell you to shut up mm -hmm. and you know it might it might force you to change and you might have to go through hardship for it but like you come out of it and like that's how you've learned social skills yeah that's how you've learned how to be around people without being obnoxious there was like, um, cause, you know, we were talking about sort of, you know, some autistic people being assholes. Like, <laughs> I've seen a, a lot of documentaries on, on like YouTube and stuff. There does seem to be a link between like delusions of grandeur and autism. And sometimes that can be a, a bit of a problem. There's like this, uh, have, you, have you ever heard of iDubbbz? <laughs> yeah, well, he he did this documentary about this uh, this this kid in America. He's not a kid; he's he's a man, but um, in America, <laughs> and they do like lightsaber fights and 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 stuff. And it's it's all very funny to watch because they get really into it, and it's like treat it like a death deal. 
<laughs> because because they have like these constructed sort of like ideas of of how the world works, and they haven't really been exposed or um to real life, and they haven't learned, and you know, sort of had to go through that transformative process of growing up. Then they they it can cause a lot of difficulty, I guess. Yes. A lot of, you know, violence and, and stuff. But the, the thing is, is that if, if an autistic person grows up in a, in a healthy environment, quite, quite often I, I've found that on, on a lot of occasions, they can be quite in tune with what is right and what is wrong. And the, the moral values are more constructed. Well, they're also the people who like end up in full time employment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like it's 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 not just the social because in some ways, like a, a <laughs> there's a strong part of me which is like I don't care if you don't like autistic people, if you find autistic people difficult, like all right, <laughs> um, may, maybe inform yourself, you know, um, <laughs> maybe maybe be a bit more understanding, maybe don't like actually expect all humans to work around you. And I also feel like sometimes it's it's over exaggerated how difficult autistic people are. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like autistic people like demanding um the the least amount of organization or competence and people are like, oh they're so uptight and I'm like, mm, not really. It's just that according to the sort of normal social rules, that's not that's not an acceptable adjustment. Or it's not a normal adjustment. It's like in in often it's like it's not unreasonable de- demands. <laughs> yeah, it's something quite simple, isn't it? It's just yeah, well, like it's having a schedule. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of people would say that having a schedule is just like generally a good thing. But like, what if you what if you need that schedule and people don't commit to it like you do, and people let you down? Like, surely that's bad anyway. Surely it's not bad because it's affected an autistic person, but you've just let someone down. Um, but like, I mean, that aside, as so- like putting the social side of things mm-hmm. away, the material consequences are vast and very significant and like unaddressed mainly. I mean, when autism is discussed, we all know like. Are uh, aren't autistic people funny and quirky and do silly things? Like we all know that, and we know like, ah, oh, like Sheldon Cooper can't interact with people. Oh. oh, he makes pop culture references and and like Star Wars and physics. He's a bit blunt. Oh my god! Yeah. And, but like we know that side, and that side is like because that the entertaining side of autism we see it all the time whenever autism is being represented what isn't represented is uh 16% of autistic people are in full time employment um disabled women are uh sexually assaulted five times as much as women who aren't disabled <laughs> you know being autistic uh makes you very vulnerable economically <laughs> yes It's very likely that for at least a long period in your life, if not your whole life, you are going to be dependent on other people like being nice to you, basically. And what if you grow up in an abusive household and they want to get rid of you like age 16? What are you going to do then when like you are already not as able to move through this society as someone without autism? It would be bad enough if you weren't autistic, but you, in this situation, you're autistic and you're doing that. Yeah. And this hap- it happens a lot. <laughs> well, it adds another sort of element of, of difficulty because if, if you find it hard to understand, you know, a lot of, a lot of autistic people have the um, alexithymia, struggling with um, categorizing and understanding emotions in yourself. Understanding. I wasn't familiar with that term. No, I know. Yeah, it's recently something that I've that I've looked up. But yeah, like with the emotions and understanding yourself and understanding other people, it, it's obviously going to be hard to. You're going to be in in any case. You're going to be very vulnerable for that first yeah. 
16, 18 years of your life on other people. And you, you've got to have that, that structure. And you, if, if you don't have that structure and the people at school don't get you and they don't support you or the teachers don't get you and don't support you and even in some, t- some cases can be harmful as well, well, and and like we know that this is getting worse because I mean, look at how much pressure teachers are under, and the the lack of funding in schools. Yeah. Um. I mean, we're we're told that there's been an increase in funding in schools, but if you look at it in real terms, there is there is le- there is less funding. Mm-hmm. That is. It's just true. <laughs> you can, you can. But you've you've also got got the uh, they've they've reduced the funding for like special needs education by yeah, yeah, everything. Yeah, yeah. I think have they dropped it down to like zero? So SEN funding, like the last time I heard about it, was terrible. <laughs> it's it's like zero pounds now. Like, don't quote me on that, but it's 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 bad. Crazy. I engaged with it, but the thing is, is like I I must admit I I. I got so engaged with these things and the thing is it's it's so upsetting you have to there's a point where you have to stop looking yeah because you're so upset by it because it's it's not nothing it's pe- it's people's lives there's something deeply it deeply disturbing about like cuz obviously we can sort of put ourselves in in them shoes a little bit easier but like we've got through it haven't we yeah. like we we're adults now and we struggle but like we got through it they're going through it and it's it's like pretty much the worst time of your life i think it's tragic that other people get to enjoy like pretty nice childhoods that's not i know that's not true of everyone and everyone experiences difficulty in their life of course but like a lot of people they they won't know just how hard it is <laughs> to be an autistic child without support and it's it's very difficult and you don't look back on it with sort of oh, rose tinted yeah. goggles you, you you think of it as badly as it was you're like that was terrible <laughs> and i'm saying like doesn't now now it doesn't even require a teacher to be specifically malicious what it what's happening is like it's pretty inevitable that people like us will be neglected because there aren't the resources or the time for teachers to focus on people like us. You know, like it, it may just happen by accident, but like th- that's not an excuse and it's not it's not fair. The government should be accountable for that. It's it's their decisions, they've made them, and if people suffer because of it. These children can't stand up for themselves right now because they're they're children. <laughs> um, they need adults to say on their behalf, like these children need to be looked after just as much as any child does, and you've let them down. Yeah. And because you've let them down, they're less likely to be employed when they're older, they're less likely to get into higher education, they're less likely to have like healthy decent relationships or like know what healthy decent relationships are because obviously if you like neglect yeah well the the, your childhood provides a lot of your your at your sort of framework to what normal healthy relationships are and if you're without that like you're, you're you're basically lost in the world and i think I'm not saying, like, because I've been talking about about neglect in, like, in sort of an academic sense, but what I'm saying is, like, it also means, like, teachers not noticing that bullying is going on or not noticing that someone's, like, struggling to interact with people. And the thing is, is, sometimes all it takes is a little bit of guidance. It's just someone, like, being gentle and being, like, look, I know, I know that you don't understand what you're saying or what you're doing. And or like I know you don't understand that like you're being bullied, <laughs> or that these people are making fun of you, but like th- this is what's happening. Yeah, and it's gonna it's gonna impact you later in life more than you can, especially especially like in teenagehood. Yes, I mean the the reason why I started doing the the documentary was because like the rates of mental health, suicidality, bullying, social isolation, exclusion. 
in the workplace and at school is just absolutely abhorrent. Like it's it's awful. And I was trying to think of some some way of trying to put it straight in my head. Like we've got things like the National Autistic Society fighting our case. We've got other organizations that sort of pitch in. We've got representatives and people that talk about autism. Why is it that nothing's being done about this? And I think the problem is, is that people just really don't understand like what autism is like, not, not from, not from like a, people understand the medical stuff, the social interaction, the the bog standard bullet points of stuff, but they don't fully grasp an, an autistic person. They don't have an experience of an autistic person. No, they're not. They're completely unfamiliar with it. And I think, I mean, this is what we talked about briefly in my interview before, is like, people need exposure to things. People need to be exposed to things to understand them. Yeah. Often. And like, we, that, that's, that's going to be a problem because it's not like we can organize all autistic people to meet all not autistic <laughs> people. Like, it's not going to happen, but. There has to be that level of ex- exposure for it to become normal to, ex- to the extent that we see, we see these mental, mental health issues as a, a group of people, you know, just ignoring the autism label that have these statistics applied for them. We need to do something about that. But because people don't really understand autism and they don't see the opinions of autistic people and, uh, you know, a lot of people would would say that they don't consider it to be a disability in in some sorts, maybe more like a disability. If people were to see it like that, then maybe we'd have more action on the mental health side of things, the policies and the education. Like, it's just, it's crazy, isn't it, that all of well, this is I going on? I think it's on. also worth, I think, I, I, and I don't want to do down the work of organisations like the National Autistic Society, which is obviously, like, worlds better than I've I forget its name. I know I hate it. Um, <laughs> we don't need to say it. If you, oh, everyone it's knows, the American yeah. One. yeah but <laughs> you, you know what? I was in totally infuriated because Matt Hancock. There is a video of Matt Hancock endorsing that organization. Uh, so if you want to go find that and also be infuriated, uh, you're welcome to. The reason he read it out is because they endorsed him on their Twitter, and I was like, this is beyond yeah. farce, isn't it, really? Um, I actually had a little bit of a sort of hiccup, like, when I first started doing uh, YouTubing. I decided to sort of, like, do a video for Autism Awareness Week, and that particular organisation that I'm not going to say, <laughs> because, you know, they might sue me or something. <laughs> that, that which shall not be named. That one with the sort of cooler sort of tone around it, and... <laughs> you know, that sort of, that item that a lot of children have that they can piece together. That sort of organisation. Uh, yeah, puzzle pieces. Yeah, <laughs> yeah something like because, that. Because, you know, puzzles, be- because all autistic people love puzzles, <laughs> and autistic people, I just like, I, I like the idea that you can t- define aut- autism by it being puzzling. Yeah, I think maybe what they're trying to go is it's like, it's like the missing piece. Oh my god, but it's so kitsch. It's so kitsch. It's so, like, it's so weirdly cute. It's so, like, I mean, and this is the infantilizing it's child, it's thing ch- It's childish, again. isn't it? Yes. It, we need that adult autistic side to it as well. Well, because we are adults. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, like, it's also, like, I mean, it's the complete erasure of, like, autistic people, like, having sexuality is, you know, interesting. <laughs> but, I, like, I just wanted to say, like, and I don't mean to do down the work of individuals who, who are part of the National Autistic Society, and I'm grateful to them because I, I used their website quite extensively when I needed diagnosis. But I feel like they're not unflawed, and the way they represent autistic people isn't unflawed. And I think they, like, when I've seen, um, like, advertising for, like, their charity events and stuff, the first thing that I see is a picture of, like, an autistic child, often, like, and, like, it's it's often a picture which, like, portrays them in a especially disabled-looking way. (laughs) 
from my experience, it usually appears in the mainstream media as sort of like a sympathy kind of angle. Like it's they're trying well, to big, big like themselves the up. Thing. Like yeah, yeah, it's a tragedy. We're helping them. We're giving them a stage on, you know, like Britain's Got Talent or something, something like that. And look how happy they are now. We've made their their trauma, their struggles and traumas into something great. You know, it's it's all that kind of stuff. It's all about like sympathy and. I could rant and rave about. <laughs> you're I, you're familiar with the medical model of disability, I presume. Yeah. Um. Well, in terms of like, because I know there's the autism is usually related to like the social model of disability. Is that like the opposite? Yes. Well, the medical model of disability basically says that the purpose of diagnosis is that like there's a problem that needs to be fixed. The point of diagnosing something is to make it go away and that the ideal human is a non-disabled human mm -hmm. and until you're not disabled you are not ideal um and this makes you a subject of tragedy right an affliction it also like it justifies this is why it's controversial it justifies everything from like treatment which in many cases people could view as a positive thing to justifying like the practice of eugenics mm. Because if you view disability purely as a negative thing, then why would you in any way like advocate the existence of disabled people? This is the problem with the medical model. Of course. Where was I going with this? <laughs> yeah, we were talking about sort of like the representation of, you know, the autism and, you know, like the sympathy and stuff in the media. Well, the, the thing is, is like, I think something... I'm not meaning to underdo the struggle that people with physical dif uh, physical disabilities or physical impairments go through because like I, I can't I can't even relate to it because I like I don't I'm not missing a limb. <laughs> but the thing is is like if you lost your limb in an accident or something, even if people view it as tragic, they, they view it as a tragedy that happened to you. You are still a person distinct from the tragedy that happened to you in some ways. Yes. You will you'll still be viewed through that lens and people will still be like horribly patronizing to you because they just see you as disabled. But like that they they will uh, in some way be able to recognize that you are a person. Yeah. I really hate the word low functioning, but it's the it's the term that people understand. <laughs> oh, I I mean that there's not a nice word that someone's come up with. <laughs> um, but like, if you are a low fun functioning autistic, you're just not a person. It's not a matter of tragedy. You just aren't a person. You are a, you're like viewed as like just, just a problem for other people to deal with. And I've, if we're going to talk about representation, I want to like make this absolutely clear. We've got a huge problem. In that there is a great number of people who who should also be able to identify as autistic, just like us, but they can't communicate. Yeah. They can't communicate what their experience is. They can't communicate how they'd like to be represented, or the sort of sort of people they are, or how they how they feel about the way they're treated because they can't communicate. Yeah. And that doesn't mean they're not people. Because you're right. There is no way, nice way, or or PC way of saying low functioning autism but if we if we're just to just get over that like <laughs> well you, at some point you sort of have to don't you it is the elephant in the, in the room when we talk about like awareness and and all of that kind of stuff and the experience of of autistic people although yeah we, we share a lot in common with people that oh, difficult in it to not use that word we share a lot in common with that group of people, like being sort of. I can't. <laughs> well, I, I, I feel like I feel like to be to be as succinct as possible about it. If we call autism an identity, autism as an identity also has attached to it impairment. There are yes. autistic impairments, and what impairments you have and how severe they are uh, is different from person to person. Mm -hmm. And the impairments you might have might mean that you are nonverbal and need 24-hour care. 
this is going to mean that your experience of life is um considerably different to like how I experience life because you know I can I can live independently enough <laughs> to to some extent to be able to like almost pass under the radar if if I really went for it <laughs> You you might it might be possible that you wouldn't know that I'm autistic. Yeah. Um, but there are some there are some people for this for whom this is not true, and it it may never be true. But I think like, and I've got a quote from um the Ooh. book on a uh, disability studies a student's guide, which is edited by Colin Ca- Colin Cameron, which I think like puts this this problem very well. The removal of people identified as having significant impairments from the mainstream of social life has rendered impairment a subject of fear and embarrassment that non-disabled people feel unsure about and uncomfortable dealing with. This is what's happening right now. Yeah. Like, you don't know what to say. It's like you can't talk about it. It's not even just with non-autistic people. It's like there, there are some things that you can't say in the in the autistic community from what i've gathered from from instagram and and chatting to people the whole sort of the impairment side of things is is very much sort of state stayed away from because it's like oh you're acknowledging what hans asperger said and i'm like i'm like if that's if that's how you feel you're missing the point Mm -hmm. because if you if you let hans asperger define what autism is that's the problem i feel like if we're gonna move on Moving on is is having the ability to say, no, I'm going to investigate what autism is and I am going to self-actualize. This is going to be me deciding for me what autism is because society or like Nazi scientists (laughs) don't get to impose on me what I am. And they certainly don't get to impose upon nonverbal people. Like they do have an impairment, and like that does have to be addressed in order for them to to be able to live well. But like, it doesn't have to be a definitively bad thing. And this is the point of the social model of disability: is disability isn't like the responsibility of individuals to overcome. Disability is something that is imposed upon people by society. Yes, I think I think Asperger's. Just, I know Asperger's is no longer. A term that's. that's well, I don't think it's a diagnosis in uh, not in this country. I think it's the same in America. Mm-hmm. Some people, some people are really upset about that because, like, because that's what they were diagnosed with, and that's. I think this it still stands. I think it, uh, the the diagno- the original diagnosis is still stand, but it's it's yes. just that yeah. If you've already been diagnosed, with yeah. It. Well, I, I suppose suppose this is a good way to sort of like. You know, to talk about the particular representations and things like film yes. and TV, which I feel like autism is either portrayed to be a tragedy or it's portrayed to be an amazing hero-like quality. Or savantism, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, like that, or or a mixture of the two. It's never just an an autistic person, and I think no. one of the things that sort of astounds me quite a lot is that although although this does happen in other groups people who play these autistic characters are not necessarily autistic in in most cases i think it was like something stupid like five percent which is a is which is a difficulty obviously but, like the bizarreness of it is like because of the the democratizing effect of the internet Probably the greatest representation of autistic people exists in like stuff like memes. <laughs> That's bizarre. Like or YouTube videos. And like I or YouTube. I mean, and this is like I'm gonna I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna mention a, a social media platform that I have never used and I don't intend to ever use. But like I've 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 been told many things about 4chan. Oh, 4chan. <laughs> and the prevalence of autistic people on 4chan. Like, it's funny to hear you talking about, like, safe speech. I'm pretty sure safe speech is non-existent on, non-existent on something like 4chan. And then, like, I suppose I suppose Reddit is, is a similar thing. It's more mainstream. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And 
a lot of like young people, especially like online young people, some of their like main exposure to autism is going to be through like 4chan and Reddit. Like previously, yeah, that would have been unimaginable. Like if you knew about autism, it was because you watched Rain Man. Yeah. <laughs> but like the idea that like people people find out about autism by like potentially like through like not very good people as well like potentially through people like spouting like disgusting views you know like really terrible things Mm -hmm. um but that might be what people's perception of like autism is in the mainstream i don't think media's caught up with that yet because i don't think media i don't think television and like film media has caught up with the internet like whatsoever no definitely there is it does tend to be sort of miles ahead of the mainstream it's like the internet is sort of the explorers and then when they when they find a new colony or an idea then the the mainstream follows it yeah the frontier i think probably in the next 30 years we might begin to see that change as people our age are the people making yeah. television programs or autistic films. people leading autistic organizations well, not just that i feel like our generation because oh there's this term called infobies when you become like obese on information like we, we are a generation that have adapted to absorb data yeah. all the time <laughs> and i think it's made us it's it's made us just just more aware than other generations were about things because we're constantly exposed to it. I mean, like, I'm not sure trans people would be discussed as widely as they are now if, like, if the internet hadn't come about. Communities would have existed in, like, specific mm-hmm. places. Like, you would have had to, to go creep. somewhere to meet, like... Well, yeah, but, like, also just, just because there were only a few places that were like secure for certain kinds of people and i think saying about autism is like i don't know if autism has ever really had that as a group i don't think there's been like a place where autistic or like lots of autistic people went and gathered i think from from experience a lot of the it's it's never like a specific place it's either on instagram it's it's sort of like a circle of people autistic people putting out content and they sort of link up with each other and form these i'd say sort of like blocked off groups most people they they market their content towards autistic people and then autistic people follow them and then they're sort of a group made out of that and then i suppose you've got the facebook groups which give people give people a, a opportunity to sort of talk to other people and share opinions and all that I think we do have that to some extent. People talk about internet, the internet being alienating and isolating. It's funny to think that, like, for autistic people, like, it's probably had yeah, the opposite yeah. effect. Probably united autistic people like more than anything else has. But yeah, I, I guess I just mean like, as we grow up, and we're the people in charge of things, just because we are the age to and the other people are unfortunately probably unfortunately passed away because like that's mm-hmm. the nature of life it will start to leak in to things your documentary is it just demonstrates this any media that is being made and perpetuated about autism means that it is leaking through but the thing is is if it's only on youtube i'm not I'm not disputing that YouTube is a massive platform and used by like billions of people. Of course it is. But like, you know, if something's on BBC one on a prime time slot, you have a guaranteed yeah. audience <laughs> all across the UK, which is not something you necessarily have with a, like a YouTube channel. You have an audience, but like that audience could come from like all different parts of the world. Do you know what I mean? And, could be all different ages which it's not a negative thing you don't have the certainty of it like being viewed by lots of a group yes, of people it's, it's not saying that you'll get you'll get the numbers up yes a lot of people who are doing some really good work on these social media platforms raising awareness and and sort of sharing their experiences but unless we can get it to be talked about in the mainstream eye 
there's not really a chance of breaking through yeah yeah breaking through and and having a a, a positive impact and a social change but let, let me ask you this what what sort of main changes do you think would combat this impro- this problem that we have with sort of air quotation mark inclusivity well i i think the awkward the awkward thing that no one ever wants to talk about is that the industry is like the film and tv industry is incredibly corrupt <laughs> it could be a small group of people all together in a room saying like well you're gonna make the next big hit mm-hmm and like sometimes it opens up to like a few new people, but it's it's pretty uh, stationary, and the people that are most welcome are the people who've been to Oxbridge, or they've like gone to the right acting school. Yeah, but it it goes beyond that because you could say, well, that's not a problem for like a lot of people though. There's there's loads of people who are evidence that that's that's not entirely true and yeah there there are a few there are a few examples of people uh, managing to get on tv without having all the support and money of other people but you know think of a tv executive they are rivaling probably lots of different streaming services lots of different tv channels to make the next big thing and it can't just be the next big thing. It's got to be the next big thing for, like, years and years to come. They need to be absolutely sure that it's going to make a profit. Yeah. And if it doesn't yeah. make a profit, it's worthless to them. Try briefing them with your uh, concept for, like, a sitcom, like, all about autistic people, all written by autistic people, like, with all autistic actors. Um, Not appealing. <laughs> That is not an appealing idea because the likelihood in their mind of that making a profit, that being like a sure sell, no, it's not happening. You know, I I do sort of, I feel like some of the attempts of organisations or or people to breach that gateway to it being talked about a lot, it's, it's always like superficial stuff. And I think when we had our little chat we talked about the manchester students union with the the jazz hands oh, the clapping yeah, yeah, and the yeah. clapping is you know that that's that's sort of like it's it's good in a way that it gets some exposure well, the, the irony of it is is that like piers morgan was talking about that <laughs> yeah so the irony is it broke into the mainstream but what broke into the mainstream wasn't that autistic people need to be acknowledged and the way we live needs to be adapted so that everyone can be included. That's not what broke through. What broke through is, how dare you say I can't clap? <laughs> how is that positive? I know, it's... All, was, all that was created was outrage. So what happened is people. it didn't force people to think Maybe I should make more of an effort to accommodate people in my life. It it did the opposite. It made people <laughs> hostile. Mm-hmm. It was like, oh, so it's it's the bad disabled people once again trying to ruin everyone's fun. <laughs> That's what happened. Yeah, well, it's just it's not something that that's gonna you know be quite big on the hands. Um, but it's it's also something that makes a good headline. What I'd say is, I think, if we want to see change, like, there are people out there who, like, want stuff like this to work, people like us. You've got BBC Three and Channel Four, both uh, doing initiatives to try and get new people onto telly that have never been on telly before. And not just get them onto telly, but get them, like, full series. And, And I'm not just talking, like, comedy series like documentary series you know mm-hmm. um what, a channel that no one talks about but like is one of the best channels that i've seen for like opening up to people yeah is bbc alba no one knows about it no one watches it basically but it is like 
a BBC channel that is entirely in Gaelic. They only show TV <laughs> programs made in Gaelic. And you'd think like, you'd think, oh, that, that's got to be like, why would I be interested in that? I've watched some of the best programming that I've seen in years on BBC Alba. The best programming, like the best travel programs, the best history documentaries. I'm not saying like we need to demand that the BBC have like an autistic channel. But if if BBC Alba can do it, we surely we can, you know? Well, it's, it's it's funny that you mention that because um about like BBC Three and BBC One because I actually I recently um interviewed a guy called Barry who if you not have you seen the the video what not to say to an autistic person uh it's quite a popular uh, one yeah 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 well yeah, he's I have seen it, he's yeah. he's in that video and um it is a bit of a crazy video but I suppose that does I mean it it got lots of views it got upwards of about 3 million views and it was aired in on BBC One but again it's it's taking that angle of whinging again it's like yes. oh what well, you shouldn't say to me don't say this to me it's it's not about getting personalities onto telly and having chats with them and and discussing things it's all about oh look look at these people whinging well i i think also <laughs> like but we've got to maybe also like in some ways some if I really let myself get like bogged down about telly stuff like the Big Bang Theory, and I recommend reading. Uh, there's this article by a guy called David Hartley who also went to the University of Manchester and wrote a novel, a fantasy novel about autism for his dissertation, um, <laughs> which I thought was really cool. Mm. He's done uh, an article on representation in autism, which is is really worth reading. Um, what was what was the book called? Because I've I've recently read a book called uh, The Speed of Dark. I don't think it's no. It's like I think it literally has autism in the title, but like I can't. I'm, I'm like I'm really sorry. I can't remember. Oh, but his fine. name is David Hartley. We'll put it. We'll put it down in the put it down in the description for people to in click on. Yeah, in the bio for Very people nice. to look on. <laughs> but like I I just wanted to say like. Although, like, TV and film are obviously important, we've got to remember that, like, it's not the only media that exists. And, like, there are... I'd say, like, (laughs) music is, like, weirdly very diverse. And you find a lot of people who have conditions in music, they speak openly about it. And, like, it's it's pretty progressive, actually, because, like... I I think the only problem is like people just simply don't know and people don't watch the interviews, you know. But like, you've got people like David Byrne, the frontman of the Talking Heads. Uh, I believe he's done a TED talk on autism. He's just <laughs> he's just a really nice guy to have as a representative of autism. Mm. I told my colleague today that Gary Newman was autistic, <laughs> and he had no idea. But, like, these are people that, like, they're well-known people. They're not nothing. They're, like, very much within the mainstream and they're autistic. Um, If more attention was paid to people like that, um, I think that that could be a way of achieving progress. And then, like, there's there's other forms of fiction. Mm -hmm. There's autistic artists. (laughs) So... If you feel bad, if you've watched like a terrible episode of, I've never watched Atypical or the A Word. I actively oh, the Good Doctor, which is I think um, one of the newest sort of autism related. Oh. Yeah, I I haven't watched it. My my <laughs> brother's watched it, and he said that I should. He's he's going to lend me it. So. Oh, he recommended it. Yeah, well. Oh wow. I think it's pro- <laughs> it probably is good. It's just uh, I'm very. T- sort of tentative around uh, choosing to watch something that's about autism because I don't well, want it to infuriate. Antsy, yeah, it just infuriates me. It's like... <laughs> and and they, they highlight things that are, you know, sort of to do with sort of the medical. You can tell that the writers have just gone through and just briefly sort of skimmed through what autism's about. Well, why don't we talk about 
tropes then like because I feel like that's a just br- even if it's briefly like talking about the, the tropes in media about autism um because I think that like that's that's one of the key things that like they get wrong I think often like autistic characters aren't universal characters uh what makes a character a universal character well I'd say like making them the protagonist and the reason for that is because like formally the the reason you have a protagonist is the protagonist should be like the main person that you spend most time with like on screen or on the page uh it's the person that like you're you're most supposed to like sympathize with or understand so if you want to make someone a universal character you make them the protagonist but also like um there's someone who who has a lot of different characteristics <laughs> and you you by spending time with them you get to learn about like all their different behaviors and the sort intricacies of, the intricacies i think one of the the main sort of i guess protagonists in sort of mainstream kind of film would be that of newt from the fantastic beasts eddie redmayne um plays plays newt really well and it from from what I've gathered from sort of researching around it, because I, I made a video on YouTube about it, and he re- he portrays you know the typical sort of Asperger's personality, not personality, but he portrays a, an autistic character extremely well. I think New is New is an interesting one because like I <laughs> in the main part I would say I don't really enjoy that film, <laughs> um, but I think. I mean, like, I think one of the best things that Newt achieves is actually, like, men can be effeminate and not and it not be terrible. Yeah, yeah, I suppose. Um, which I, like, I think that's... I wouldn't necessarily say that, like, I really identified with Newt, but I think it was, like, the best thing about that film. And seeing as, like, representation is in such a state, I would agree with you, like, it does fulfil the whole making someone the protagonist, um, featuring, like, elements of, like, a disabled personality, but without, like, making it, like, that that is all they are. Yeah, it has to be sort of intertwined in there. But the, the problem with that, again, is that it, if it's intertwined in there and it's not about, it's not singly about autism, then it, and pe- a lot of people don't know. It makes autism know. a side issue, which is, like... It's like the the extra reading, it's like... In the blogs and stuff. You can do that once people have a cultural understanding of what autism is in the first place. Agree. <laughs> and, like, it's this... I'd say, like, my example of that is Saga Noren from The Bridge. Um, and I think, like, I, I can't stress this enough. Like, if you haven't watched it, especially as a woman, like, watch it. <laughs> and also, like, not especially if you're a woman, because it, in many ways, like, Saga Noren achieves, like, being the universal character. Whether you are a man, young, old, autistic, not autistic, she's deeply sympathetic. You spend the time with her on screen and you're like, oh my god, you're so engrossed in her story and that's fantastic. But like, they do also, I would agree, like, with, with Newt, they make similar mistakes with Saga. Also, like, I don't think they completely escape, like, the disability is like, the thing you use for comic effect yeah. is like because it's a crime series a lot of it is very very dark and kind of sad and it's like uh, i guess we'll do a joke about her um misreading a situation <laughs> yeah i don't want people to not find autism funny because autism is funny i find autism funny it makes you do silly things but like it being like the main source of comedy is a problem um what I, I brought today <laughs> as an example of, I mean, it, it's never explicit, like, there's no, like, oh, this is an autistic character, but it is a character that I would deem autistic, is uh, the character of the Snork from the novel um, Comet in Moominland, which I had the luxury of reading when I was in hospital <laughs> last year. Um, I had it by my bed and I, I read yeah. the entire thing and the last time I'd I'd read it was when I was like a tiny child, so I'd forgotten most of it. But like finding the snork, I was like, oh my god, this just is an autistic character. Um, and like, um, 
there's just this specific bit. Uh, it was a long time before the snork came back with the wood. Well, there you are at last, said his sister. It took quite a time, said the snork, because of course I had to find pieces that were all exactly the same length. <laughs> Is he always so particular? asked Snufkin. He was born like that, said Snork Maiden. And then it's just like, they just move on to the next thing. That's that's the mention of that. And then like throughout the book, like he's he he's one of the characters who who's makes like the funniest observations. It's because of like his determination and his organizational skills. Like, although he's annoying sometimes, and like they get bothered with him being like obsessive about getting things right, it's because of that that they survive like an apocalypse. <laughs> So it's I think I think there is like a difference between autistic comedy and making comedy from autistic traits. Like instead yes. of oh that was an awkward kind of moment that makes people laugh, it's it's actually genuine differences and so more, more intricate and more sort of um, well developed humor around it. That's what it's yes. missing, I think, in, in sort of things like the Big Bang Theory and Atypical and all of those kind of things. Well, the, the, the absurdity of Bing, uh, Bing Bang Theory. Bing Bang that? Theory. Um, the, absurdity of, <laughs> <laughs> but the absurdity of destroy this TV program and let it be forgotten forever. Uh, <laughs> uh, the absurdity of the Big Bang Theory is that uh, Jim Parsons, who plays Sheldon Cooper, researched autism thoroughly and spend time with autistic people and cares about autistic people he's on the record saying and doing i did not know that yeah and he he got into disputes with the writers because he was like the way that you're representing this character is not good (laughs) and they basically ignored him (laughs) so you have this, and it's it's so, like, I'll reference this clip that, like, I watched just before I came onto the podcast because I've seen it before and I remembered it and I was like, this is a clip that needs to be mentioned if we're talking about representation. It's um it's called, literally on YouTube, uh, Sheldon Imitates Howard, um, The Imitation Perturbation. It's, it's bizarre because, so Howard, who is a... a supposedly a friend of Sheldon and series it consists of him like entirely parodying Sheldon but he's not just like making fun of Sheldon like I could make fun of you Tom I could be like I mean I can't think of like funny things (laughs) specifically about kickboxing but like I'm sure with enough effort I could kicky kicky flicky flicky just but like you it wouldn't be offensive do you know what I mean (laughs) <laughs> Howard's Im- like parodying of Shepton is entire Sh- Shepton Sheldon is entirely offensive. Like it's just ha ha, your disability is funny and should be mocked. Yeah. But he he basically like is like, are you trying to upset me? While they're like they're still in like sitcom mode. It's like an <laughs> it's like someone like a normal person has been sat in a sitcom and has a sitcom happening around them, while they respond, like, totally (laughs) realistically. You have, like, an actor who's, like, trying to do a good representation of autism. And, like, I would say Jim Parsons achieves that, and it actually makes the program that bit more upsetting because it's, it's so much more, like, actually watching an autistic person be harassed. When Sheldon, yeah. like, stands up for himself in the series and, like, says, no, you shouldn't treat me like this, they all act like, ah, oh, what's wrong with you? Like, it was obviously a joke. Like, are oh, you being so bitter about it? And it just, it makes it a very strange thing to watch. It's not, it would be a lot more simple if Jim Parsons was completely bad at acting like an autistic person. If Jim Parsons didn't resemble an autistic person at all and it was, like, bad all round, it would be easier to just be like, this is just bad. But the fact that Jim Parsons is kind of real is what 
sort of makes it worse. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's sort of the, the possibility of it is it could be a lot more than it is. Well, it could be like Sheldon could be a good character. I think in some ways Sheldon is a good character and I'm sure there are probably like uh I read an article about how once uh the Big Bang theory was aired there was a huge rise in America in diagnoses of autism. Really? So it obviously, yeah. So it obviously did reach people. Mad. It obviously mattered to people. And it, it's it's that means I have a difficult relationship with it because yeah. I hate it. I can't stand it. But you also can't just simply say all it is is bad and it's done nothing good for representation. It's, 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 there is kind of a theme with with all of these sort of examples that we're giving and the theme is that yeah it's it's sort of doing some good but it's not it's not driving home the the real important things that need to be noticed and that's because it's not led by autistic people no that's exactly. because autistic yeah. people have been like thrown out of their own party and then like i feel like the worst examples of stuff like i'm afraid to say like the a word because the main autistic person is like the child they're kind of not the most important thing in the series. The most important thing in the series is the drama that happens yeah, the, in the family. the interaction between the other people. Yeah, and they're like, you know, once again, it's like, oh, the autistic person isn't really a person. And if they are a person, like, the most person they are is, like, an undeveloped person, a child. <laughs> um, You mentioned to me that since the documentary you've sort of had, uh, your views on autism and, and sort of the topics around it um, have changed a little bit since since the actual filming of it. I know you mentioned at the start that you sort of, you were a bit giddy on the information, but yes. like what, what sort of, in what sort of way have your views changed on it? Could you sort of explain that to us a little bit? The way my views have changed is that I I think and I don't think I meant to do it but when I when you first interviewed me I put quite an emphasis on like autistic people can be normal <laughs> and I think I think there's a problem with that because why should you strive to be normal and what why is an autism normal Yeah abnormality is normal Abnormality is normal if it's my life, if if it's your life and it's our everyday life and it's many people's everyday lives, why why do we have to be normal? Because we are normal. <laughs> I mean, it's not like if it was the other way round, expecting people to behave more autistically, that would be absurd, wouldn't it? Yes. You know, if I expected non-autistic people to be more autistic pe- around me, I think they'd be like, that. you're ridiculous. <laughs> but that's that's accepted in our society. And I, and it's, it's so accepted that in places like America, it, it drives people to send their kids to institutions and be abused. <laughs> that's not right. No. I guess I've... I've thought a lot more about like what does autistic activism mean? What does standing up for autism mean? And like what does it mean to be autistic? And I'd say like don't don't feel weighed down by a medical diagnosis or lack thereof. Obviously, if you don't have a diagnosis, accessing support is almost impossible. <laughs> so in some ways, like, yes, it is a good thing, but the thing is, is is the reason you need the support as much as you do often in the first place is because you've already lived as an autistic person and had, like, all the struggle and all the problems of being an autistic person. Like, you never had to have a diagnosis to go through that, but when you need to deal with the consequences of that, that's when you need an official diagnosis. I think that's a hypocrisy. I don't want autistic people to be self-conscious anymore. <laughs> I don't want autistic people to or constantly live in anxiety about how they behave and the sort of people they are. I want the the effort to be coming from the other side. A little bit helps from the other side. A little bit helps, exactly. 
And that was that was one of the things that um, we touched on quite a lot when we were doing the actual interview. Yes, yeah. I'm just having a look through the sort of notes because I, I did sort of watch <laughs> watch our interview back very recently. Well, I mean, I'm glad you did. It's it's like <laughs> it's funny. It's funny to think that it happened what like almost a year ago now. Yeah, probably more. Probably more than that. Like it was a. <laughs> It's quite the quite a bit of time away. It doesn't feel like it's that long, but I guess that's one thing that happens when you <laughs> getting old. <laughs> well, how do, how do you feel? How do you feel about like what what happens if you know all of the efforts from the media relations team and the National Artistic Society promoting this documentary? How would you feel if if it does become a big thing, and that maybe it, it could be this this big thing, and we the individuals as part of the documentary could have have a large impact if they wanted to on society. How would you feel about that? To be entirely selfish about it. <laughs> entirely selfish. If like if someone like Chris Packham took notice of it, which I also think would be a great idea, call out to Chris Packham. Um maybe even at him <laughs> at some point. I might at Chris Packham on Twitter. I yeah, might... well we'll have to we'll have to like um what like a podcast. full scale attack <laughs> on like all public autistic figures? Be yes. Like, yes. Take you can, notes. You can head it. Me. You can head it, Esme. You can um. be that. You can be that side to the um, promotion. The, the militant autistic. Um, <laughs> I feel like it's the 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 most frustrating thing about it, and I, and this is how I felt coming onto the podcast is for people who are already autistic. This isn't news. We're just saying things that they already know and feel and have seen. Yeah? If you're autistic, like, this is standard. And it's not that complicated, but it's made complicated by the lack of access that actually non-autistic people have to autistic people. It's, it's yes. funny to say that it's non-autistic people who have less access, but that, that's true. It's the same. It's the same in the the Instagram community and stuff. It's 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 quite easy to, you know, get a, get a following of autistic people because you know what we say is relatable and it and it's searched for. Also, you're looking just, for it as an autistic person. Yeah, yeah. But you you that that market of of non autistic people needs to be in some way tapped into. It it just has to be in order for it to become something big like in the spirit of that i'm gonna like i'll do a shout out to one of the first <laughs> things that i encountered uh it, it actually came directly from reading the bbc uh article about the bridge and saga noran uh it had uh laura james in it um it links i believe that article to uh, Laura James giving an interview on the Ouch podcast, which is a BBC podcast for like, which is all about disability and stuff. That was quite influential to me because it was the first person, the first vo- literal voice I heard of a woman talking about autism. And the the shame of that is like, you know, I was talking about it's hard enough getting onto the BBC. Well, that that's on the BBC. Like, you can go listen to it now. Yeah. But how many people have heard of it? No one. Yeah, that's that's the problem, isn't it? It's got to be it's got to be viral, and I think uh, the reason why I've decided to put the, the documentary out at this time is because it links into Everyone's a lot of current home, current affairs. Everyone's at home <laughs> as well, and there's also a lot of talk about disabilities and COVID, and yes. we've got the whole thing with Anne Hegarty that happened a couple of couple probably about a few years ago, um, talking about autism on I'm a Celebrity, and then you've yes. also got You've got Greta Thunberg, who's obviously leading quite a big campaign in the terms of climate change. And I think whatever you think of Greta Thunberg, I mean, she's I a kid, can't, isn't she? I just can't. I, my heart, I, I really okay. I don't want to <laughs> come off as though I'm saying she's a tragedy, because I'm yeah. not. I'm not saying she's a tragedy. I'm saying, like. I've gone through very stressful and difficult things in my life, but I was lucky in that I was able to deal with them well enough 
I got myself like in a safe place and I was an adult for most of it. Um, I was not a child. <laughs> I was not a child and I didn't have like what must feel like the whole world against me. Yeah. Well there's that there's a lot of there's a lot of publicity around sort of people getting like, oh, well, why is Greta Thunberg being this 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 voice and stuff? And it's like, it's as if people don't see the the intention behind it. And although, yeah, she probably, you know, doesn't have as much knowledge as like a climate scientist and stuff. But at least she's she's speaking being out the voice. about she's speaking she cares out about, about. It. Yeah, I feel like when whenever has like. Being the most educated on something, being the thing that matters most. Yeah. I mean, like, I'm not, I'm not going to say that Thomas Paine wasn't an educated man because that's just not true. <laughs> he was, but like, what made um, common sense such uh, an influential piece of work and motivated people to rebel against the English monarchy, which is a pretty big thing to do. The reason that happened is because it is a motive. It's passionate. Yeah. You can tell that Thomas Paine believes in the cause, and you can't help but you can't help but feel that reading it. You can't. You just can't shut yourself off to it. And I think like people ask, why is Donald Trump the president of America? He never seems like he's not being entirely himself. And I think yeah. people really like that. People like it when they think someone's being themselves. Strength of character. And I feel like like people aren't attacking Greta Thunberg because she's not academic. They're not attacking her because of like any practical or legitimate reason. It's it's they're attacking her personality. And yeah. she's like, it's not right. And also um there's a lot of disabled people who complain about like the representation of the super crip. So, like, a disabled person who's, like, so exceptional. Like, the one disabled yes. person who, like, isn't a burden, isn't, like, a scrounger. You know, like, Paralympians, for example, they're, like... Yeah. They're not like the other ones. I, I, when Greta Thunberg started to become popular, like, The Guardian wrote these articles about, like, oh, what an inspiration she is. And I'm, like, autistic people don't exist to be inspirational to you <laughs> it's like that's she's not she's not an exception no <laughs> that's that's the funny thing like like she's she's definitely not the exception at all at any sort of level she is just in my eyes regular old aspie like <laughs> which is well, which is mad she's just a human being and it, like she is people complain people complain like Oh, why? Why is she the one leading the movement? Like she's not an adult, and she says herself, "Like, why am I being the one made to take responsibility for everything that the environmental movement represents? I'm literally a child. Like, yeah, this the 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 fact that it's me and not an adult is disgusting. And I think that's that's the whole like driving force to the 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 whole campaign about. It. It's just funny that. It's it's funny that that people don't pick up on that, and it's it's. Just, I think a lot of that is that she's she's not the best at speaking in English, and like <laughs> like. But I mean, she's Swedish. Like, yeah, what? exactly. I I can't speak Swedish, and and being autistic <laughs> and and being a kid and being on such a massive platform, like of course she's good. Like, and they were saying that she cries crocodile tears. It's like. For God's oh, sake! Oh, who's she like... making it up for? I mean, and I'm gonna okay. I'm gonna bring up. <laughs> I'm gonna bring up. Like, <laughs> some people might be like, "What are you talking about?" Um, and it is a bit that. But like, honest. have you watched Tiger King? No, I haven't. I um, haven't. So, like, the main appeal of Tiger King appears to be like, look how weird these people are, and a lot of the people in Tiger King have disabilities. <laughs> Joe Exotic has a disability. And mm -hmm. I'm not gonna speculate that Joe Exotic is autistic, but like he has tics. He's not like entirely socially competent. Like yeah. he may not be autistic, but like he's also not like he clearly can't like conform. 
Do you know what I mean? Like, he just, he can't do it. The people at that park, most of them were, like, homeless, had, like, been addicted to drugs or, like, ex-convict, and that park was their, their home for, like, many years, and they loved it. For the first time in their life, like, a lot of people in it say, like, I felt happy. I was doing something I wanted to do, and I'd never known that. And that's what, yeah. like, that's what Joe Exotic... Maybe I maybe not to credit Joe Exotic Joe Exotic too much because he's not like a great person all of the time, but like it was his park that like meant people could have that. Yeah. Jeff Lowe, this like really terrible human being, entirely takes advantage of Joe Exotic. And because of Jeff Lowe's actions, the animals stop being fed, everything goes wrong. These people who have it, this has been their home and and one of them like this this woman like her arm was bitten off from by a tiger she could have had her arm reconstructed but she decides to go back to work she gets her arm amputated and goes back to work the next day because she doesn't want the park to look bad right yeah. all of these people they have everything taken away from them and not because of any action they did not because of anything wrong they did but because of the selfish, terrible actions of other people. And the thing is, is I, I, the thing that like made me so upset about the conclusion of that program is so much of it is to do with the fact that they aren't the sort of people that society is okay with. It's not because of the things they did. It's because people were uncomfortable with it. There's, uh, there were other people doing things like much worse, like much, much worse, right? There's, this one guy, Doc Antle, which, like, was basically enslaving women and, like, continues to do it, right, at his park. But he's he's got away scot-free. Joe and the people that he worked with got indicted, everything taken away from them, and predominantly, like, disabled or queer, not welcome people. <laughs> and the fact that, like, Tiger King is like mainly a source of entertainment to people. Like I find upsetting because it's more than that. It it is a a piece that that highlights some issues and it highlights struggles and 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 problems within a certain community. I guess. I feel like on the other side, though, I hope that some people watch it and they're like, "This is wrong," <laughs> and I yeah. hope I hope some people like me, attach themselves to these people and are like, this isn't right. <laughs> I mean, it's also like the federal government in that programme don't come out looking well. Yeah. Well, this Ameri- is it is American, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know, did you watch Chris Morris's latest film? No, I actually, to be honest, like, I've been so bogged down with all the documentary stuff. <laughs> oh, yeah, of I, course, I, I haven't like... done anything like... No, no, no. <laughs> I haven't watched any films... You were living in isolation before it was cool. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Autistics run the place now. No social distancing is mandatory. No talking to people, getting close to people. Get out of my way, walking down the street, part ways. Yeah. Oh, That's I what mean, I'm God, about. I used to, I used to hate walking <laughs> to uni and like everyone just looked so good all the time, and I was like, oh my God. Like this is so, just this is just an anxious situation. Like the, the, me rocking no up in relief. an extra large t shirt <laughs> and a pair of grey Ritz tracksuits. I'm like, yeah, I don't care. Yeah, but at least you were like, at least you were like physically fit. Like, I no, I was not fit. I wouldn't oh call my, myself shut, physically fit. Oh my god! I was. Oh my no, god. I was. I was practically anorexic. Like I oh, was. Yeah, awful. but I mean, like you weren't like what people like mock. Yeah, Do you know what I mean. You weren't yeah. like chubby, like people. I, I, I mean, like, just if you, if you're like poor, don't have good taste in clothes, or like, not, don't have the body type that's like approved of in society. Maybe reconsider going to the University of Manchester. Um, <laughs> hot take. <laughs> I, I would love to like continue chatting for <laughs> ages, and um. <laughs> It's it's really nice to, to to have a chat about these these issues, just to sort of round round up some f- free sort of main important points that you want to drive home. 
what what would you say those points are like what do you want people to take away from the podcast uh i think to take away from the podcast is that there is reason to be optimistic try your best to be optimistic even in the face of bad things to try to maintain hope it's and i mean if you're autistic that's probably going to be one of your best traits <laughs> <laughs> don't punish yourself for that also don't think that the way that you express yourself has to be purely through the the lens of having a disorder because you aren't a disorder you are a person and try to think of yourself as a person as much as you possibly can that's probably the second thing i would say third thing i would say is documentary's very good and i mean that sincerely the documentary's very good i really enjoyed participating in it i think i think everyone did and i hope the documentary uh goes places because it deserves to i hope so <laughs> one can hope one can hope, definitely. Well, after I at Chris Packer, we'll, we'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah, you can be my you can be my militant <laughs> my militant artistic sidekick. <laughs> so we round up with the last question then. Oh God, there's another so one. There. Okay, there right, is. Go on, yeah, go there on. is. I mean, to be honest, like <laughs> often, like the 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 structure of the podcast is that we sort of go through you know general questions, but I think that if possible the dialogue should be flowing as much as possible and talk around the issue. Yeah, like so I guess it's sort yeah, of a bit, yeah. yeah, it's a little bit different to the sort of the usual podcasts that, that go on. But I, th- I suppose that's, that's a good thing and it's, it's nice to have these conversations. Well, it's, it's how I prefer it. I don't like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if I, if I wanted it to be like formal and structured, I'd listen to like BBC Radio 4, do you know what I mean? Yeah, so... <laughs> yeah, definitely. Three minutes, I think. <laughs> What does autism mean to you, Esme? Uh, a hell of a lot. <laughs> um, I, I just hope, I, I really, really, really hope we get to say what it means <laughs> because I'm honestly terrified that it's the legacy of the Spurger and, and pretty not, not great people. I don't want, I don't want people who are not only, like, uninformed about autism, but, like, bad at talking about it to be the people who, who say what autism is. And, unfortunately, like, that that's the history of autism. Like, From a I was Nazi about to say scientist. Sasha Baron Cohen. <laughs> Sasha Baron Cohen. <laughs> well, well, yeah. Well, like, Hans Asperger, Nazi scientist. And what, what would you say, what would you, if you, in an ideal world, what would you sort of, if you could, boil down what autism is what would you want it to be what would you want people's reaction to it's not a problem it's like you like me great (laughs) like it it's it's just it's not an obstacle it's a difference well maybe not even a difference it's just like this is a state of life i don't single out um horse riders I don't like say, oh, we should treat horse riders a different way because, like, who rides horses? Weird. It's weird to ride horses or be into horses. Mental. I not only do I think we should single these people out, but I think we should put them in special institutions away from the rest of the world where they can't like talk to people. And I don't think we should like let them uh <laughs> write anything or do anything because it like might disrupt the rest of non horse riding society. <laughs> if you think that's absurd, uh welcome. <laughs> so my my ideal is it's it's just we don't even have to have this com- conversation. Thank you very much for that. Brilliant. So um Esme, I know we've we've sort of briefly gone over the links and stuff. I do know know that you 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 like you not much into the the whole sort of social media kind of side to things. So w- <laughs> would it be would it be safe to say that if if someone wants to like ask you a question, they can um, email me and I can forward it to you. I wouldn't mind doing like a Q and A of some sort. 
yeah, if like all the questions were like forward to me, forward. And we we to could me. do that. For, forward the stuff to my to my email address if you've got any questions for Esme. Yes, Esme. Ah, oh, God, damn it! I did it again. <laughs> Esme. Well, Esme, Esme. But the horrible thing is, is that Esme, Esme is the correct pronunciation, but I hate it. Oh. I know, and I so, always, I always call you. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, of course, every everyone who is listening, you can find a blog po- blog post that a a blog post <laughs> blog, blog post. post. <laughs> you can find the blog. Oh. <laughs> 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 yes, you like can. Bog. All right, just you can find the bog, the bog post uh, yeah. on the Asperger's <laughs> in society.com website. It's going to be going up, I think, on Tuesday. And I'm I'm hoping to get this, this podcast out tomorrow Tight as schedule, well. Yeah. Tom. Tight With the ba- and oh. also the behind the scenes uh, YouTube video as well. Which oh, I know. You've got a I lot know. of work. But it, it'll, it'll all be going out. <laughs> Um, and obviously, yes, the the documentary will be going live on Wednesday at six pm. Yep. <laughs> and I'm very happy about that, and I'm I'm very much looking forward to it. So if you do want to go check that out, you can either head over to the Asperger's in Society website or check out my YouTube channel, Asperger's Growth. And if you want to sort of get some you know, behind the scenes um, info and, and just see what, what's going on in, on the day to day. You can always check out my social media links, which are at Asperger's Growth for Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And then, of course, if you want to appear on the 40 or podcast and you've got an interesting story, um, you can contact me at aspergersgrowth at gmail.com. Thank you very much for coming to uh, crack out, yeah, crack the, out uh, the champagne. champagne. Crack out the champagne and maybe a bit of cake if you're not an alcoholic. Yeah, yeah celebrate, celebrate with me. Come to the premiere <laughs> and tell me what your thoughts are. Um, <laughs> have you enjoyed the podcasting experience, Esme? Uh, yeah, I have. Some... It's not too bad, is it? Once you get over the first <laughs> 10 minutes, it sort of flows a bit more easier. No, once you settle into being egotistical, <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I'm always very appreciative of, of anyone coming on to share their opinions and their experiences. Well, it's, it's been lovely. Thank you very much for listening to you as well, people. Thank you for tuning into the 40 Audio Podcast. And I'm um, going to say uh, you're looking lovely today, and I hope that you are uh, getting all of your day. You're staying hydrated. <laughs> Hashtag uh, hydrate the Aspies. Cause... I find people who are hydrated, you know, there 50% you more fit than people who, you there know, you are so, thirsty. Quote from Esme to round up the podcast. <laughs> Get yourself hydrated. Watch the documentary. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. And I'll see you in the next episode of the 40 Audio Podcast. Thank you very much, guys. Bye. You can say bye as well. Oh, bye. See you later. Bye. <laughs>